Well, welcome to everybody who's uh, connected to us today to this uh, public lecture on Zoom, as uh, so much is these days. Um, I'm Rob Massey, I'm Deputy Director of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'll be uh, hosting this session today. Uh, I should say we have a couple of housekeeping rules, but nothing like the usual ones where I have to talk about fire safety. Uh, in this case, it's really just to tell you how you can ask questions and interact. If you're a participant, you should only be able to see pretty much a Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I'd ask if you have questions for the speaker, if you could type them in there and uh, the speaker and I will be able to see them and we can go through them. I will read them out at the end and we'll go through them and try and answer as many as we can in the time available. Uh, but beyond that, um, obviously the main reason you're here is to hear from uh, Professor Chris Dunn about black holes, Einstein's gravity and rocket science, which is a obviously an intriguing subject and I think a very nice one on which to end uh, 2020. We've had a, a full programme of lectures this year, not well hindered obviously a little bit by the pandemic, but nonetheless we've, we've carried on with that programme and we're happy to continue doing so into 2021 as well. So I won't talk for any longer except to uh, welcome Chris and uh, to invite her to talk to you well for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, after which we should have a, a good deal of time for questions. So welcome uh, Chris and I will disappear at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to be talking about black holes. So that's obviously, we're going to be talking about Einstein's gravity, but Rocket science, what, what does that have to do with anything about black holes? Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll know the answer to that. And uh, I'm Professor Chris Stone, and I'm in the Department of Physics in the University of Durham, which is a beautiful city. And one day when we're all allowed to travel again, uh, if you haven't seen it, you should come and see it. So let's start with black holes. And uh, Observing black holes, there's been a lot of black holes in the, in the news over the last few years. And uh, my favorite quote about black holes comes from an old sci-fi series on TV called Red Dwarf, which went along the lines of, the thing about a black hole, its main distinguishing feature is it's black. And the thing about space, your basic space color is it's black. So how are you meant to see them? So looking for a black hole on the black background of space isn't gonna be a great way to start. So what we're gonna do in this talk is we're gonna do, okay, what are black holes? And talk about Einstein's gravity, but then we're gonna do the, so how could we ever actually see a black hole on the black background of space? Right, that's where we're going, let's make a start. So first up, black holes. If we're going to talk about black holes, we're going to talk about gravity. And if we're going to talk about gravity, well, we need to talk about Einstein's idea of gravity. Newtonian gravity was fantastic. Uh, it was a fantastic intellectual leap to say, oh, maybe, maybe the same force that holds the moon in orbit around the earth is the same force that makes an apple drop to the ground. That's an incredible leap of imagination. But on the bigger question, on the more important, the more kind of physical question of what is that force? What is gravity? Newton famously said, I frame no hypothesis. He said it in Latin, which made, makes it sound better, but basically it's no idea. And we had no idea until Einstein came along. And in Einstein's gravity, it's not just a more accurate, more exact way of calculating gravity, though it is, it actually answers that more fundamental question, what is gravity? And the way to think about it is, uh, think of uh, the surface of space and time as spread out like the surface of a trampoline. If there's no mass on that trampoline, then it's a flat surface. And any small particle going across that flat surface will travel in a straight line at a constant speed. If instead I put some whopping great kind of bowling ball mass on my trampoline sheet, it's gonna bend the surface of the trampoline, not just underneath the mass, but way out as well. And then anything traveling across that curved surface of space and time, its path is going to be bent because it's traveling over a surface that is curved. 
And the way to kind of really see this is to, to think about two amps on a curved surface. If, uh, if I put ink on their paws, claws, whatever amps have, if I put ink on, on their feet and say, uh, head north, go due north, uh, and they set off going due north, left foot, right foot, middle foot, left foot, right foot, middle foot. If I put them on a flat sheet of paper going due north, and they'll go due north at a constant speed, and they'll maintain the same separation. But if instead I put them on the surface of a sphere and set them off from the equator and said, head due north, they'd head due north. And as they headed more and more north, they, they'd get closer and closer together. And they could think there's, um, there's some inexorable force dragging us together. Yeah, they could, or they could think they're just walking in a natural way on a surface that's curved. Actually, it turns out that the sort of curvature that we're talking about for gravity is, is more like a saddle shape than the surface of a sphere. So it uh, bends towards us in one direction and away from us in the other direction. That's the sort of curvature we're talking about, but anything where you've curved the surface of space, then anything that goes across that curved surface, its path will not be a straight line anymore. And so this is the way in Einstein's gravity that you should think about gravity, that it's this large scale curvature of space and time. We often draw it like this as a kind of two dimensional uh, flat sheet with a mass on it bending it. But, but of course, space is three dimensional and I, I keep saying as well, time. And so, so really you're, you're meant to be trying to visualize this bending of space in three dimensions and then bending time as well. I, I find that hard to visualize. So instead, we're gonna go back to the flat sheet. And uh, so this gives us a really nice way of visualizing what's going on. It also gave Einstein one of the first tests of his new theory of gravity. Obviously, uh, anything that travels across that curved surface uh, is going to have its path bent, and that includes light. Whereas in Newton's gravity, light doesn't have mass, and Newton's gravity was all about things having mass. And so, so Newton's gravity is a bit kind of, hmm, not really sure what we should do about light. Whereas Einstein's gravity is kind of like, well, light travels across the surface of space time. If that surface is bent, the light travel path will also be bent. And, uh, and so the idea was that they could do an experiment to test this. Did it work? Because the sun is the biggest uh, bit of mass in our solar system. So that's going to be where space and time are most curved. If we can uh, find a distant star that just happens to line up uh, on a line of sight that's close to the limb of the sun at some point, then it's going to go through those curved bits of space and time and its path is going to be bent. We're going to see it from the Earth and it will mean its apparent position is shifted across the sky. Now, obviously, there's a problem, which is when the sun is in the sky, it's too bright. Uh, but we've got uh, the moon, which just happens to be the right size to give us solar eclipses. So this is uh, the experiment that they did. They traveled to some island uh, 101 years ago, actually, and took photographs that showed that uh, when they were uh, the top panel there shows the star positions they were seeing uh, when the sun was in this part of the sky but eclipsed by the moon. And the bottom panel shows where those star positions were when the sun wasn't in that part of the sky. And uh, this was absolutely clear that um, Einstein's gravity predictions were giving the right answer, that Einstein's gravity was working. So how does this help us about black holes? Well, okay, let's now think about gravity. So this is kind of a, a, mon, a kind of cartoon of our solar system, the 
yellow blob is the sun, and then the white uh, grid lines give you the surface of space and time curved around the sun. That green dot is like the Earth, and the red is the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Obviously not to scale. So, um, the, the Earth is being kept in orbit around the sun because it's trying to walk in a straight line path, but the surface uh, of uh, space and time on which it's walking is curved because of the mass of the sun uh, in the center of our solar system. But we want to talk about black holes, so we need to make gravity stronger. And uh, one way of making gravity stronger is we could take the same amount of mass and squeeze it into a smaller space because then we've got the same amount of mass, but because we've squeezed it smaller, we've got regions of much stronger gravity that we couldn't get at before. So the sun itself was filling the, the, that region, we couldn't get, whereas if you squeeze it, you, you get to these regions of highly curved space and time. But of course, if we've made gravity stronger, then, uh, if we were to try and escape from the surface of the sun, we'd have to be traveling faster. So we can do that again, squeeze it again, and we get stronger gravity, stronger space and time curvature near the surface of the sun. So we'd have to be going faster in order to escape. Hmm. But there's a speed limit in physics, and this one is non-negotiable, and it's the speed of light. So when you get to the point where the gravity is so strong that you need to be traveling at faster than the speed of light to escape, you can't travel faster than the speed of light, so you can't escape. So this point uh, where you'd have to be traveling at the speed of light in order to escape, this kind of marks the event horizon of a black hole. It marks the point beyond which we cannot get any information out from uh, below that at all. Now, those, those of you who've, who've been watching what happened to the Earth will realize that this isn't actually like so many bad sci-fi movies where black holes are these inexorable cosmic vacuum cleaners that, uh, that anything gets sucked in. Yes, they have very strong gravity, but where the Earth's orbit is, the curvature of space and time haven't changed. So if the sun were to become a black hole, which it won't, it's not big enough, but if it were to become a black hole, actually nothing in the Earth's orbit changes. Obviously then there's no light from the sun, so all the plants die, all the animals die and we die, but apart from such minor considerations, the Earth's orbit is not inexorably sucked into the black hole, the Earth's orbit keeps going as it does now. But this event horizon, uh, another way of thinking about it, which actually I find more kind of visual, is, uh, is to think about it as space and time themselves are falling into the black hole. Uh, far from the black hole, that, that speed is quite slow. But as you get closer and closer to the black hole, space and time themselves are going in faster and faster and faster. And the black hole marks the point at which the infall of space and time is uh, the speed of light. So even light, as it tries to go outwards, is swept inwards by space and time themselves uh, falling into the black hole. So, this tells us it's a special radius, this event horizon, the radius that even if light was trying to go directly outwards, it would be swept into the black hole. It's like, it's like uh, me trying to swim against the current in a river. If my maximum swim speed is faster than the current, I'll move forward. But if the current is faster than my maximum swim speed, even if I'm heading due outwards, I get swept inwards. So that's black holes, fab. But I've now got a black hole on the black background of space. How, how are we even ever gonna test this? So let's actually go and look at some of the amazing new bits of science over the last couple of years 
that have enabled us to see the effect of a black hole. So one of the first ones, uh, this got the Nobel Prize a couple of months ago, was looking at the motion of stars close to the center of our galaxy. In the center of our galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole, but there's also lots of stars that are orbiting around. And uh, over a period of 20, 25 years, the orbits of those stars close to the galactic center, close to um, the, uh, the black hole in the middle of our galaxy, which is marked on here with that little yellow star. But in reality, there is no little yellow star there. There is no light from there at all. Uh, it's just very dark. But if that was nothing there, then you'd expect these stars to be moving in a straight line at a constant speed. Quite plainly, they are not. They are orbiting around something that is dark and very, very massive. And uh, so tracing this, using the stars as points of light to trace out this space-time curvature is um, giving us amazing insight, amazing ability to see the effect of this incredibly strong gravity close to the center, to the central black hole in our galaxy. So that closest orbit, the one that's the yellow star, uh, the ellipse in yellow picked out, it gets within one light day of the position of the black hole. But one light day compared to the size scale of the event horizon of the black hole in the center of our galaxy actually isn't that impressive. It's 2000 times bigger than the size of the event horizon. If we really want to look at what strong gravity does, we need to get closer. And uh, there aren't any stars uh, close to our galactic center black hole that get closer. So how are we gonna do this? Well, if we could get stuff closer, then there'd be another feature of Einstein's gravity that we could probe. So we talked about the event horizon where light trying to get directly outwards, radially outwards gets swept back in. But light could also orbit around the black hole. So if it wasn't going, trying to go straight out, but was trying to go across, there'd be a radius at which light itself could orbit around the black hole for a couple of times before escaping to infinity or being swept into the black hole. And this gives us another way of looking for black holes. So what we've got here, this is um, a very massive galaxy in the Virgo constellation. It's called M87. And it's actually a, a huge galaxy. It's bigger than our own galaxy. Um, and what you're seeing here, the stars in the background image, you can see it's an elliptical galaxy. And um, the size of this on the sky actually is, is quite, quite large. It's kind of like the size of the, the full moon in the sky. So that's, that's yeah, about, about that big. But then when you focus in with different types of telescopes, different types of light, you see that right at the center, there's, there's a very narrow feature. There's a jet that's spitting out from the center of this galaxy. And there's a massive, supermassive black hole down at the bottom there. And there's actually material falling into it. There's very kind of tenuous plasma that's falling into the black hole. And uh, as that plasma falls in, it's getting uh, tied up by magnetic fields and spat out in these amazing jets. But that tenuous plasma is emitting a little bit of light. It's really dim and really hard to see, but it's emitting a little bit of light. And so close in then, there's this tenuous plasma emitting a little bit of light that means that we can pick out the black hole shadow against that little bit of light. 
And so this was the iconic image of the black hole shadow that uh, hit the newsstands a couple of years ago. And just to get some idea of this technical achievement, it's that the size of that black hole shadow that they're seeing, it's kind of like being able to read the text on a newspaper when the newspaper's in New York and you're sitting in Paris. It's that tiny, tiny angle that they were able to resolve. And it's an amazing technical challenge and an amazing technical achievement. So what they're seeing here is there's this tenuous gas that's kind of falling into the black hole. And as it's falling in gravity, uh, it's got some of the energy, some of this gravitational energy and it's making it glow. Not very bright, but it's glowing. And so that light is um, being uh, bent, its light path is being bent by the black hole. So anything, any of this tenuous gas that's emitted behind the black hole kind of gets, it, its path gets really bent over the top of the black hole and around the sides of the black hole. And that photon orbit we talked about, some photons kind of get caught there and it makes them look, it makes it brighter. And so you get this bright ring as a kind of halo around this dark black hole shadow. And this is what they're seeing. And this is an amazing achievement. But yeah, I mean, really heroic. What, what if we had more matter falling in? It would be a lot brighter and it would be a lot easier to see. Maybe there's other ways of testing Einstein's gravity that aren't quite so heroic. So let's, instead of talking about supermassive black holes, let's talk about smaller sized ones. The, the sorts of ones that form at the end point of the evolution of the most massive stars. So stars like our sun and most of the other stars you see shining in the night sky, they're shining by fusing four hydrogen nuclei together and making one helium nucleus. Another of Einstein's famous equations, E equals mc squared, uh, comes in because the four hydrogens we started out at, if we put them in a balance, they're slightly heavier than the one helium we end up with. And E equals mc squared, if we lost some mass, we gained some energy, and it's that energy that causes the sun and most of the other stars you see in the night sky to shine. But stars, though they're big, they're finite. So at some point, you run out of hydrogen. Bad plan. If your star's massive enough, then gravity, now you're not having this energy from nuclear fusion to keep the gas hot. Gas hot tries to expand and push out to balance gravity pulling in. Now you've not got the fusion anymore, you haven't got the hot gas, uh, gravity never goes away, so the star contracts. Uh, but as it contracts, it heats up, and so you can uh, build up with helium. You can stick two helium nuclei together, and they almost instantly fall apart. So stick three helium nuclei together. I'm sorry, I don't have three hands. Uh, and uh, you can make the next element um, in this fusion process, you can make carbon because that's got six protons and then you take two each from those three helium nuclei, smack them together and you get carbon. And again, your three heliums you started out with is ever so slightly heavier than the one carbon you ended up with. You lost some mass, you gained some energy, you can keep the gas hot and stave off gravity. But then the helium starts to get to run out. So you could try and in increasing desperation, you can build more and more heavy elements. You can fuse more and more of these elements together. If the star's massive enough, it keeps pulling in the core, making it hotter and hotter, making these um, higher fusion processes possible. But uh, there's a problem because eventually 
this fusion swap, some mass gain, some energy, fusion works for small elements. We know nuclear power plants on Earth, they get energy from taking big elements like uranium and plutonium and splitting them apart. So small elements, we get energy by sticking them together. Big elements, you get energy by splitting them apart. So somewhere on all these chemical elements, there's going to be an, a, an element where there's nothing, where you don't get any more energy out. That element is iron. And it's actually surprisingly, it's on that first purple row, it's number 26. There's a lot more elements than iron. But when our most massive star gets such that it's got an iron, it's got to iron, it can't really do anything else. The iron is just like ash from a coal fire. It just kind of builds up. There's nothing you can do with it. It just kind of sits there, getting squashed by gravity, getting more squashed by gravity. Um, but there's nothing you can get. You can't get any more energy out of it. So, so, it, um, but gravity is squashing it and squashing it and squashing it. So how, how far can you squash this iron core? Well, that depends on how you think about the structure of matter. If you think about matter as little billiard balls, then you can squash it and squash it and squash it. And it's only when the billiard balls kind of touch each other that things would go badly wrong. But uh, one of the amazing breakthroughs of the 20th century was this understanding that actually matter isn't like little billiard balls. And the smaller the bits of matter you're talking about, the odder its behavior becomes, the more wavy its behavior becomes. This is wave particle duality. So um, things like protons and neutrons, the nuclei in atoms, they're quite heavy. They have a waviness, but it's kind of small scale. The electrons going around on the outside, they're very light. And so their waviness is really apparent. So now this iron core, we're squashing, 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 and we're squashing electrons that are wavy. And if you squash a wave, then you make its wavelength shorter. And if you have shorter wavelength, you have more energy. We're used to that in light. We're used to X-rays having a lot more energy than visible light. A shorter wavelength um, has more energy, but it's the same here. We're squashing our electron wave. And so it's got more energy. And if you think about it back as a particle, it's now moving faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And faster. Um, there's a problem when you hit the speed of light because you can't go any faster. And so this entire iron core, which is building up and building up as the fusion reactions kind of get to iron and just drop their ash onto the iron core. Gravity is squashing it and squashing it. The electron waves are getting squashed shorter and shorter, more and more energy. So the entire core is held up by quantum mechanics. But then you get to the point at which that does not work anymore. The electrons are going at the speed of light. They cannot go any faster. And the core collapses. And uh, you get to that stage when the this iron core gets to around uh, the mass of the sun, a bit bigger than the mass of the sun. And it is literally like someone took the floor away. You can't stand still in a gravitational field. Uh, the electrons have recombined with protons in the nuclei and produced neut neutrons, which is bigger particles. So they have a shorter waviness. So they fit in a much smaller box. The outer layers of the star, they were used to the core being there and someone took their floor away. So they uh, collapse inwards, smack on the core, incredible explosion outwards. These are supernovae explosions where one dying star, one dying star can outshine a hundred thousand million other stars, normal stars in a galaxy put together. 
So a couple of for a couple of months, this single dying star in a supernova can be uh, producing more light than 100,000 million normal stars. This is an impressive explosion. And uh, so what's happened in the core, this is where we really are, are interested. What's happened in the core is we now, we've taken that one and a bit times the mass of the sun and made it, rather than being iron, now it's made just of neutrons. It's a neutron star. And neutron stars are really quite impressive. They're only a bit bigger than the size of their own event horizon. You only need to squash them by a factor of two or three and they disappear down their own event horizon. That's interesting because, remember, this was what we produced at the bottom of the star and the other st and the stellar atmosphere is just kind of coming down and hitting the core and sticking to it. And if the star is big enough, that's enough to collapse the whole thing into a black hole. Black hole on the back, black background of space, that's not good. But the reason we did this with stars is because actually stars tend to hang out with their friends. So actually, um, our sun's a bit unusual in not being in a binary system. Most stars are actually in binary systems. So if one of them is a very massive star, collapses, becomes a black hole, the star next door can be lunch. And so what you can have is you can have material uh, that's spiraling into this black hole. And as it's spiraling in this immense gravitational field, it gets heated up and heated up and heated up. And uh, you can have this bright uh, disk of material. And it's, the gravity is so strong that you're getting heated up. You're not just white hot or even um, you're not just red hot or even white hot, you, you glow X-ray hot. So if you could look at the sky with X-ray eyes, you would see nothing because our atmosphere is completely opaque to X-rays, which is good news for our DNA, but bad news if we want to look at the sky in X-rays. So the short wavelength uh, light like X-rays, it's very energetic, but it also interacts with our atmosphere. And so, uh, it doesn't get to the ground. Uh, whereas visible light, much less energetic, doesn't really interact that much with our atmosphere. And so we can obviously see the sun and stars out from the ground. But this is where rocket science comes in, because with rockets, we can go above the atmosphere and go and have a look at the sky with X-ray eyes. And uh, so this was another Nobel Prize on black holes, which was um, for the discovery that actually, if you go above our atmosphere with an X-ray detector, if you look at the sky with X-ray eyes above our atmosphere, you see a lot of X-ray sources. And uh, what you're seeing there is you're seeing um, many sources where you've got a black hole or a neutron star with a companion that is being launched. And you've got this bright X-ray hot, incredibly luminous disc around it. It's kind of like a, a kind of big halo pointing black hole here. And uh, so actually, the X-ray astronomy transforms black holes from being some theoretical extrapolation uh, of Einstein's gravity. This was the first observable evidence that these really did exist. And so now when you look at the sky with X-ray eyes, you see X-ray sources everywhere. Uh, the ones in, in red, they're the ones, this is um, uh, showing the whole sky um, with uh, along the plane of our galaxy is the, um, is the central line and the central point is the center of our galaxy. And so the, the sources in red that you're seeing there picking out the structure of our galaxy, they're mainly ones like we've just been talking about, where you've got black holes with a companion star and this bright X-ray hot disk that's picking out their position. But there's other fainter X-ray sources across the whole sky as well that are mainly in blue here. 
And those are some of the ones we talked about at the start, the supermassive black holes, but not like the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, which isn't really uh, accreting very much at all, or even the supermassive black hole at the center of M87 with that iconic image, that's incredibly tenuous and dim hot gas. These are bright. These are in your face, incredibly bright uh, X-ray sources uh, that we can easily see because there's enormous amounts of material piling on to the black hole. And we're seeing as it falls in, it gets hotter and hotter and emits X-rays. And so this gives us another way of looking at um, these black holes. And so if we've got this disk, we can, we can start to think about what would we see? So if you've got material falling in, then at each radius in the disk, it's going to be getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So it's falling in and heating up and uh, it's quite dense and dense material emits a very characteristic radiation. It's just like the radiation you get from a coal fire or an electric um, heating bar. It, it kind of glows. It's just got this kind of very standard shape. And uh, it's got a very specific shape where the luminosity we see relates to the area that's emitting and the temperature. And that's it, that's all. So if we've got this disk out on the large radii, we've got quite a lot of area and not very much gravitational power. And as we go further in, we've got less area and more power from gravity. And so the temperature is gonna be going up and up and up and the luminosity is gonna be going up and up and up. And it's gonna go in and in and in. so does this go to, the event horizon, does it go to the orbit, the light orbit radius? How far in should this disk go? Well, there's another bit of Einstein's gravity that comes into play in these kind of strong gravity regions. Newton's gravity, it, it's always very easy to have a st stable circular orbit. So gravity gets stronger as you get closer to um, to the object in the sun. If we're looking at the solar system, gravity is stronger as you get closer in. But if you're orbiting, you've got something called angular momentum. You've got some sort of spin. And that's, that's something you can't lose. And uh, the way to show this is if you think about a skater spinning, um, if they're spinning slowly, if they've got their arms out going slowly, and then they pull their arms in, so if you're going to something smaller, you have to spin faster. And then if you spin faster, things that aren't very well tied down like her hair, they spin out, so there's an outward force. And so in Newton's gravity, there's always a place you can find where uh, you're at the minimum, you're at a circular orbit. If you drifted outwards, gravity would pull you back. If you drifted inwards, you'd be trying to spin faster and then that would push you back. It's a stable point. But Einstein's gravity isn't the same as Newton's. There's an extra bit to it. It's just slightly stronger. When you get into strong gravity, Einstein's gravity can be quite a bit stronger. And uh, as you get closer and closer to the black hole, suddenly you lose the the safety barrier on the inside. So if you drifted slightly out, gravity would pull you back. But if you drifted slightly in, the angular momentum, the spin isn't enough anymore to push you back. So you spiral quickly into the black hole. So this is another radius that Einstein's gravity predicts. It says not only is there an event horizon where you've got to be going straight up, um, and the, not only is there a photon sphere, an orbit where you go round at the speed of light, but there's a minimum stable circular orbit. It's um, only twice the size of the light orbit, and it's only three times the size of the event horizon, so it's really close in. But this is where you expect that disk to stop, because the disk is a circular orbit and it's gonna spiral quickly down. 
So, how could we see this? Well, we could go and look with X-ray eyes as long as we were above the atmosphere. And indeed, we see stuff. We see objects with these spectra that look just like these very simple ideas of accretion disks. But one spectra alone, that's a little tricky, but these objects also vary. The mass accretion rate through the disk varies. And that's really interesting because Einstein's gravity says, well, the mass accretion rate through the disk can vary, but this inner edge of the disk, it does not vary. It's fixed by Einstein's gravity. It's the last stable circular orbit, and that's the last stable circular orbit. Doesn't matter what the mass accretion rate is. And so for our black body radiation, this area, the emitting area is fixed. So what happens if you increase the mass accretion rate is you increase the luminosity and the temperature, but the area is fixed. And so when we go and look at these sources and watch them vary, we can actually measure that maximum temperature. We can measure that maximum luminosity. We can plot one against the other and we can extract that constant radius, the inner radius of the accretion disk, and we can watch it change or rather not change as the source increases in luminosity. And that's amazing that we're really seeing evidence for this last stable circular orbit. But I'd like you to see another thing as well, which is that we see this disk spectrum and we don't really see anything else. So according to the picture, we were looking at a disk that comes to the last stable circular orbit, and then the material very quickly spirals down towards the black hole, down below the event horizon and is lost from the universe forever. So it's dark. And this is what these data are showing us. These are different temperature, different luminosity, but what we're seeing is just the disk. There's nothing else there. <laughs> And yet we can compare these to things where we know that it's a neutron star rather than a black hole. So a black hole, the material should just slide silently below the event horizon. Whereas a neutron star has a, a surface. And so this material that's coming inwards from the disk smacks onto the surface this is not quiet and dim. This is incredibly bright shock X-ray emission. And so this is saying that uh, when we look at things we think of as being black holes, they should look dramatically different to things that we think of, or rather that we know are neutron stars because of that shock. And uh, that cyan line, uh, there is real data underneath that, but I picked it out with a solid line and you now can't see the data. In other words, what we're seeing here is we've got evidence for the existence of an event horizon, that in the black hole, there's the last stable circular orbit and then the material silently is lost from the universe. Whereas in the neutron stars, it's very clear that that was not at all silent, that there's a real clear difference between having an event horizon and having a surface. But then, of course, no talk on black holes could be complete without the final thing that's happened in the last few years, which is gravitational waves. This is another amazing piece of heroic um, technical achievement. Here we go. Because we've talked of uh, a black hole accreting material from a companion star, but if that companion star itself gets to the end of its fuel and becomes a black hole, you can have two black holes orbiting around each other. And then think about what that does to the surface of space and time. They are dynamical perturbations in the fabric of space-time, ripples in space-time, if you will. 
a ripple in the fabric of space and time. The same. So what you've got there, if you've got two black holes going around each other, then that's, per that's putting ripples on the surface of space and time. And that's taking energy and spin away from the system. And so then the orbit gets tighter, which means gravity is stronger. And so you get more energy lost and then the orbit gets tighter and tighter and, and these black holes merge and they do a burst of gravitational waves uh, that are so strong, well, that <laughs> they are detectable just about from Earth. And so this was another of these amazing breakthroughs of the past five years and another Nobel Prize uh, when the gravitational waves were detected from merging black holes. So hopefully I've given you a picture about black holes. They're the ultimate extrapolation of Einstein's gravity. Looking for an isolated black hole on the black background of space is not the way to go, but where we've got some light, we can use that to probe gravity in the strong field limit. We can do the galactic center, but those stellar orbits don't get us very close. We can do some amazing heroic stuff um, looking at the black hole shadow in M87, but we can look um, more easily when we've got much higher mass accretion rates and that accretion flow becomes incredibly bright and easy to look at. And that with X-ray astronomy, uh, we get evidence in these intensely bright accretion flows for those predictions of Einstein's gravity. We get evidence for the last stable circular orbit. We get evidence for the event horizon. Uh, but then the kind of ultimate strong field gravity test is these merging black holes, gravitational waves. But so far, everything we see says Einstein's gravity is right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was a, a fascinating talk and you'll be pleased to know there are a lot of questions that have come in on this, which I'll, uh, I'll try to manage. And I think the, the expression is triage, but I'll, I'll go through them all. Um, so in no particular order, there's um, some fascinating things here. So one of them is, is there anything beyond the singularity within a black hole? Very good question. And, and actually, that's, that's the reason for that last, um, that last sentence, that everything we have so far is saying that Einstein is right. And, and in a way, that's kind of, it's, it's good, but it's also kind of a little bit sad because what we'd really like to know, we'd like to know what's at the bottom of a black hole? What's, what's the structure of, that singularity, you've gone beyond the event horizon. Einstein's gravity says that everything gets crushed to an infinitesimal point of infinite density. Now, as a physicist, when our equations give us infinity, generally it means we took them somewhere they didn't want to go. And uh, we know that when you get to dealing with very, very small size scales, Actually, we shouldn't be using uh, standard kind of classical physics. We should be using quantum mechanics. We should be doing something about the waviness of matter. But quantum mechanics and gravity rather famously don't play well together. Uh, we don't yet have a theory that could tell us what happens when you have very, very strong gravity on very, very small size scales. And that's what we need to understand the structure of the very bottom of a black hole. Is it really truly a singularity? Does it have some quantum wavy structure? Does it get us wormholes in space and time? Um, we need a better theory of gravity, one that plays with quantum mechanics. But so far, we're, we're looking at the strongest possible gravity we could ever observe. Literally, when we do these merging black holes, these gravitational waves, and yet we're not seeing evidence on observable gravity that it's different to Einstein's. It must be different to Einstein's down at the singularity, 
but we can't observe that. So we're stuck. We need a better theory of gravity. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. I'm gonna uh, ask a couple of others, one of which actually is about the whole idea of it connecting to a wormhole or not. Uh, another one relates to a question about white holes. And uh, then I think this relates to where does the matter, which I think relates to all of this, where does the matter go after being sucked into a black hole after the spaghettification and all that jazz? Absolutely. So after it's gone into the event horizon, actually nothing much happens. So if I was falling into Gargantua, rather than one of these stellar mass black holes, then I could make it through the event horizon. Um, I'd be falling towards whatever's at the bottom and I could get quite a long way down before I get ripped apart. Um, but what the theories tell us is that you just get ripped apart and get stuck onto whatever this structure at the bottom of the black hole is that we can't yet. Uh, really understand without a theory of quantum gravity or um, gravity that quantizes. So you could speculate, okay, maybe it does give us a wormhole, um, but you'd have been ripped apart before you got through it. So I don't think that's a really viable way to uh, explore the universe, but it makes great sci-fi. It's <laughs> a good answer. Okay. Uh, looking through, there's a lot of questions here. Well, um, the next one, I think, is a fair one. Here you go. This is a good one, I think, a physics question. If mass can be turned into energy, then does the principle of conservation energy as taught in schools not always apply? Correct. So many things that get taught in schools are kind of highly simplified versions of uh, what is more fun, physics. So, uh, so yes, conservation of mass is not a thing. It's conservation of energy, and energy includes rest mass energy. So in fact, if I had matter and antimatter, I could transform all of that mass into energy by annihilating the matter and antimatter particle. And so, so yes, you can, you can annihilate mass, but you can't get rid of energy. Mass and energy are the same thing. And that's what this most famous equation ever tells us. E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are equivalent. Thank you. And I think this kind of relates to some of what you were saying as well. There's another one here, which is uh, if black holes consume matter, do they get larger, which will affect their gravitational pull? Or is this offset by Hawking radiation? And then there was another one asking can you please explain Hawking radiation, which I think you've, you've partially done anyway. <laughs> we'll has, do it ever been, and has it ever been observed? We'll do the easy one first. So okay. as the material falls into the black hole, yeah, it gets heavier. And uh, the size scale of that event horizon grows and grows and grows. And so the sorts of black holes we were talking about in, in the centers of galaxies, these supermassive black holes, um, they've grown over the process of the history of the universe. So when the universe starts out, you have the hot big bang, and uh, it's only after some time that it gets cool enough for matter to exist, it's expanding, uh, the gas eventually starts clumping, forming the first stars, forming the first black holes, the first galaxies. And these structures build up and grow as the universe evolves. And so uh, when we look back at, uh, to very large distances and we're seeing the universe, not as it is now, but as it was um, in the past, we are looking at kind of the growth of galaxies and the growth of their central black holes together. Um, so yes, these, these, um, these black holes do change their mass over the time scale of the universe. And Hawking radiation does not help us because Hawking radiation is incredibly, incredibly dim. Um, and so we have never detected it because it is so incredibly dim. It won't um, decrease the mass of these 
astrophysical black holes, it won't decrease their mass significantly for multiple times longer than the age of the universe. So, uh, so no, they are growing rather than uh, getting smaller. Thank you. All right. Uh, there's another, I think I'll bracket a couple together for you, although they're different subjects. But one is, um, do we know what pro uh, proportion of all stars are black holes or perhaps become black holes? And the other one is why, I think in the Event Horizon Telescope image, why part of the light disk around the image of the black hole seems brighter and thicker? Oh, fantastic. Right. OK. So, so yeah, we, we kind of roughly know how many stars we, we expect to become black holes. So uh, it's only the most massive ones where the cores are really kind of intensely crushed beyond that kind of electron waviness limit. Um, and so you can make models of the population of our galaxy and the, the numbers come out, I think it's something like 10 million. Some, but remember our galaxy has got 100,000 million stars in it. So, um, and not all of those will be close enough to a companion star. Only very few of them will be active in X-rays because there's active accretion going on. Um, and the second question was... I'm just looking through, I've just... Um, oh, it was the image, yes. Why was brighter? Yes. Oh, yes, that's a fantastic question, actually. So this kind of tenuous material, as it's kind of coming into the black hole, it is rotating and uh, then the light that's emitted from the, the side where the material is coming towards you, because it's coming quite fast, then there's some relativistic effects that make it brighter. And so the bright side is, is where that matter, as it's rotating and falling into the black hole, where it's coming towards you. And the dim side is where it's going away. Fantastic, thank you. There's another, there's a couple of questions here about the existence of uh, white holes, uh, which I know, which I remember being quite quite a concept in the 1970s and, and before then. Uh, what's your, what's your uh, thoughts on those? So white holes are, are um, uh, they're, they're kind of, they come out of the equations. Uh, so most of physics, all the equations are kind of, they don't really understand about a direction of time. So you can make your equations work for material coming into the black hole, uh, or you could spit things out and, and get them coming out. But, you know, the real universe isn't like that, especially the sorts of black holes we were talking about. They, it's not symmetric if time isn't infinite. Um, indeed, time is not infinite. Time is, uh, is, uh, comes in along with the creation of space and energy in the Big Bang. And so time itself isn't infinite, but certainly the time of a black hole, it can't extend infinitely into the past either because it was formed at some point from the collapse of a star. So white holes you get if the equations are truly symmetric with respect to time, but the real universe isn't like that. So mercifully, white holes really shouldn't exist. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. One final question then, I think I can see there's still quite a few here. I might suggest actually that people, if they've got you know, straightforward questions, email you if you're able to take questions. That would be fine, yes. Thank you, appreciate that. Otherwise, um, there's this final one here, which is uh, equally intriguing. Could there be quark stars, since quarks are even more fundamental particles than neutrons? A simple note to end on there, Chris. Absolutely. Well, one of the, um, so that, that kind of, we're, we're not really sure about the structure of neutron stars either. Um, so obviously the, the core of a neutron star, it's being incredibly pressured. It's really being squashed. And we can't really do even the physics we understand at those kind of energies at the moment. Uh, we think there should be all sorts of exotic particles created in there. Um, uh, but this is still, a, even though it's the sort of physics that you kind of would expect that we could do, we're still 
struggling even to really understand what that uh, uh, what those extreme kind of conditions give us in terms of the properties of matter. Great. Well, I think that's a, a nice note to end on. It, as ever, it's the uncertainty in these uh, high-end area of physics that, that, that you know, is, is where the fascination is, I think. So, this is why um, research is such fun. Exactly. No, and we really appreciate it. I should actually be, be good and uh, turn on my camera briefly. So we really appreciate everybody joining uh, you today. Um, we will put this on YouTube. It wasn't live streaming, but we'll get it up there. If uh, you want to point to, to anybody else, that would be great. Uh, and other than that, um, I can't sort of have informal words with Chris afterwards because we just have to shut down the stream. But I would certainly want to thank you very much for giving up your time today and also for uh, being so engaging and answering so many questions ac across you know, such a diversity of topics. So thank you once again and thank you to everybody for joining us. And uh, I do hope that you're able to hope that you're able to uh, come and uh, see our range of speakers in the new year. Thank you. Fantastic. Happy thank you very us. much. Bye now. Bye now.